in 2003, 90s video game icon Lara Croft finally made her much-anticipated next-gen debut with the sixth Tomb Raider game, The Angel of Darkness. With Lara back from the dead, in better graphics than ever before and with advanced gameplay, surely the game was destined to become a massive hit. But it didn't. The Angel of Darkness was rushed through development and released in a state far from how the game had been conceptualized, with severely degraded features and unpolished controls that immediately damaged the game's reputation. The game became a critical and commercial failure that effectively killed Core Design, the studio that had achieved glory when they created Tomb Raider just seven years prior, but it also very nearly killed the Tomb Raider franchise as a whole. Yet this game has a cult following unlike any other Tomb Raider game. So for the first time in well over a decade, I sat down to play through it, because I wanted to rank its levels. In the Angel of Darkness, determining what's a level and what's not a level is not as easy as it has been in the series previously. Usually I go by the rule that if it has its own name, it's its own level. I can't really justify doing that in this game, however, as some levels are clearly just sub-areas that, for memory purposes, are separated by their own loading screens and names. So I have established a new rule to define what constitutes a level in this game. If the player is required to go there, it's a level. Simple. This rule eliminates most of the sub-areas in the Parisian ghetto except Ren's pawn shop. I feel stronger now that I have defined this criteria, which leaves 30 levels to be ranked from worst to best. So join me as I dive deep into the levels of the Black Sheep of the Tomb Raider series, The Angel of Darkness. Marco Cavier's apartment is the smallest Tomb Raider level ever. It's literally just Margot Cavier's apartment. And it's not even all of her apartment. It's really nice. I could easily see myself living here. I particularly like the fish tank. The Napoleon painting would have to go though. This is not an apartment ranking, however, but a level ranking, and there's just not much level to rank here. And Lara has very little time to explore it before the cops arrive to arrest her for the murder of Van Croy she did not commit. It would be totally warranted if they arrested her for stealing Mademoiselle Cavia's valuables, however. Anyway, Lara quickly moves on to finish the game's thrilling opening section. Ren's pawn shop first appears as an optional sub-area of the Parisian ghetto, where Lara can sell the valuables she's found and stolen for cash. Cash is required for some side quests in this area, so this is a cool little feature. Much later in the game, however, Lara needs to go here, where she'll find poor Ren murdered and his shop booby-trapped with explosives. The escape from Ren's pun shop is a nice little challenge, but it's severely hampered by awkward camera angles and Lara's stiff jogging through peanut butter running animation, which is quite anticlimactic for a sequence like this. The cutscene that ends the level, however, is fantastic. Galleries Under Siege is a return to the Louvre galleries Lara explored a few levels earlier, but this time around the museum is full of enemies much more dangerous than museum guards. These bastards try to snuff out Lara with nerve agents, so she needs to get her hands on a gas mask before she can deal with them. It's probably the most combat-heavy level in the game, which is not a good thing. The combat of the Angel of Darkness is as unengaging as ever, but also much clunkier, so Galleries Under Siege is really just a level that I like to get done with as fast as possible. It's got one of the most epic cutscenes in the series though, so at least there's that. St. Eckhart's Graveyard is a very short level that's mostly set at the eponymous graveyard, but if Lara chose to help Pierre in the previous level, it begins in the apartment of his ex, Francine, where Lara can do some more stealing. She's out of control in this game. Besides a brief yet tricky platforming section, which is a rarity in the Angel of Darkness, there's really not much to this level. 
There are a couple of well-hidden goodies off the beaten path, however, that would have qualified as secrets in a classic Tomb Raider game, such as the ones that are hidden inside a courtyard that requires a very specific side flip to access. Tomb Raider becomes Tomb Desecrator for a brief moment, as Lara needs to crush a grave to finish this relatively unremarkable level. In the Hall of Seasons, Lara must complete four elemental trials for unique crystals, with each trial set in its own unique level. Wrath of the Beast is the Earth Trial, which consists of two parts. The first part is an earthquake, which is exciting at first, but it becomes a disappointing die and reload trial in Errorfest very quickly to figure out the safe path. Once Lara has gotten her hands on the Earth Crystal, she needs to pull two levers to open the exit. The problem is that Undead Knights rise from the... well, dead, and she's an easy target for their fire attacks while she interacts with the levers. Lara can momentarily incapacitate the knights, but they are only down for a brief moment, and there's three of them, so it's just not worth it. At least there's handy shower installations too. Overall, the entire Earth Trial feels quite clumsy and unfocused, and it's easily the least enjoyable of the four trials. The Breath of Hades is the Air Trial in the Hall of Seasons. It's a quite visually impressive level that certainly stands out for how uniquely it's presented. This relatively small room just has an incredible presence and sound design. The trial blows, however. Lara needs to cross a lava pit by jumping across wooden poles, which in and of itself is enough to make you sweat with these controls, but there are also dragon heads on both sides of the room that blow out gusts of wind. Overall, the Breath of Hades is a gorgeous little level, but the trial itself just doesn't live up to its potential and is severely hampered by the awkward controls and unforgiving hitboxes. The Sanctuary of Flame is the fire trial in the Hall of Seasons. Lara needs to cross a lake of lava by jumping between tiny hexagonal platforms, some of which sink and some of which rocket her into the air. This is an easy enough trial on paper, but the game's stiff controls make it so hard. And the frustration reaches a fever pitch whenever Lara almost reaches the other side and then gets wiped out by a destructive wave of fire. The wave is timed, however, so once you figure that out and learn to work around the awkward controls, reaching the fire crystal becomes slightly less arduous. The Sanctuary of Flame looks absolutely incredible, however, and might be one of the most visually impressive levels in the Angel of Darkness. Neptune's Hall is the Water Trial in the Hall of Seasons. It's the least creative of the four elemental trials, but for this reason it might also be the most enjoyable. There is no gimmick here to overcomplicate anything, it's just a swimming puzzle. Just like the Neptune trial in the first Tomb Raider game. Although those spikes that come out of the tunnel walls sure makes it feel more like the water trial in Tomb Raider 3's Lost City of Tinos. Too much for my liking in fact. Neptune's Hall is never going to win any prizes for innovation, but it's a fun little water-themed level that's also very beautiful. Boas Returns is a boss level, and the boss in question is Eckhart's scientist, Christina Boas, who he fed to a big cocoon monster a few levels earlier. As a result, she has mutated into a big scary bug. People have always told me about the scary bugs in the Angel of Darkness. I suppose this is what they meant. Much scarier than Boas, however, is the fact that this is a level in a Tomb Raider game where we don't control Lara Croft. Instead, we play as Curtis Trent, Lara's mysterious partner in this game. Eh, he's alright, I guess, but no thanks. Give me Lara back, please. The boss fights in the Angel of Darkness are all more or less hampered by half-baked ideas or poor controls, except for this one, which I think is quite enjoyable. It's refreshingly straightforward and plays like it's supposed to. Although getting Curtis to aim at Boaz's exposed sacks can be awkward as hell. The second phase in the boss fight is almost laughably easy, but hey, I'm not complaining too much about that.
Parisian Backstreets is the game's opening level, which unfortunately means it's also the game's tutorial level, because there is no Croft Manor in the Angel of Darkness. So gameplay is consistently interrupted by Lara's instructions to the player. To climb onto the bin, stand next to it and press the up cursor key. During which she can't move. To grab the balcony, walk to the edge of the bin and press the jump key. I get it, there are new mechanics to introduce. I feel stronger now. But it really takes you out of the level, which is a shame as it's got brilliant atmosphere. Lara's on the run from the police here, so the distant police sirens and the grim weather serve as a perfect backdrop to the dire predicament she's in. I do admire how the developers use the tutorial to advance the story, it's just so distracting when Lara's constantly breaking the fourth wall and telling you to press the cursor key and shit. Still, this level's got atmosphere for days, which I appreciate a lot. The archaeological dig marks a special moment in the Angel of Darkness, where the game transitions from a string of urban locations in Paris to ancient wonders deep beneath Paris. As a result, this is when the game begins to feel like a traditional Tomb Raider game. In this level, Lara needs to locate unique symbols so she can decipher a mysterious door that leads to the Tomb of Ancients. In order to reach that door, however, she first needs to descend and then ascend a big dig. I said dig. Unlocking the door requires solving a puzzle where Lara must turn discs and lock specific symbols in a specific order. This is a fun little puzzle as you need to find these symbols in different locations. The archaeological dig is very much a transitional level, but I still kinda… dig it. Derelict apartment block is the game's second level, where Lara has been cornered by the police inside an old dilapidated building. She needs to climb the entrance hall stairs quickly, because the police are busy breaking down the main doors. Unfortunately, these stairs have seen better days, so they can't be climbed the conventional way. And once the police breaks into the building, they'll start filling it with tear gas, I think, so Lara needs to get a move on. This is a pretty unique premise for a level, but I don't think it's entirely successful in execution. It lacks urgency, I feel, largely because it's very easy to reach the top of the building, but also because the cops don't seem to ever catch up to Lara no matter how much time she spends exploring. Bouchard's hideout rather uniquely consists of two parts that aren't connected to each other. The first part can be accessed from manholes in the Parisian ghetto and is completely optional. It's a good idea to go there and explore it however, as it's got lots of goodies and valuables to sell at the pawn shop. The second part is accessed by naturally progressing through the story. This claustrophobic little hideout has crumbling floors and filthy drainage water that Lara must swim through, which really makes this place feel well hidden. Lara eventually finds and interrogates Bouchard in his little bunker, but not before witnessing a horribly mutated man, which is a genuinely unsettling sight. Bouchard's hideout is a decent level, but I would have liked if there had been more traps and obstacles in Lara's way to him, because it feels a little underwhelming that a place she spends so much time searching for is so easily conquered. If Margot Cavia's apartment was nice, Von Croy's apartment is freaking awesome. Not only is it decorated with historical artifacts from his many journeys all over the world, but it also has a quaint little spiral staircase to a badass upstairs bedroom with windows in the floor and lots and lots of space. It's also a grisly murder scene, however, as this was where Van Cry was murdered at the beginning of the game. And it's soon to become another murder scene, as Lara must deal with a hitman simply known as The Cleaner. This level is basically a game of cat and mouse between Lara and this bastard. And Lara is the cat, of course. The cleaner has rigged the apartment with explosive traps, however, so Lara can't just chase after him. Instead, she needs to carefully navigate every corridor so she can get close enough to pop that prick between the eyes. Von Croy's apartment is a fun and rather unique little level and a satisfying finale to the game's Paris section.
the Monstrum crime scene is the opening level of the proc section of the Angel of Darkness and it makes for a very beautiful introduction. It's set at a town square covered in snow, which Lara isn't probably dressed for. She's simply too cool to be freezing. Lara is here to inspect the most recent Monstrum killing and so is local reporter Ludic, with whom she has a rather... interesting conversation. You unsavory little runt. You have a nasty mouth, lady. What's your name, Mr. Reporter? Ludic. My name's Ludic. Tell me what else you know, Ludic, or I'll show you how nasty I can get. Ah, the Strahov is the Mafia center of operations in Prague. There's been a lot of activity there recently. You're well informed. I'm a professional. It's my business. I've got dossiers on all the main players. It'll cost you. Okay, I'm in. You call these dossiers? Yuck! Eventually, Lara gets inside the building where the crime was committed and finds an underground lair in which she gets her hands on an engraving for one of the Obscura paintings. Considering how short the Monstrum crime scene is, it packs a bunch of atmosphere and variety in its gameplay, but we only get to scratch the surface of this beautiful level before it's over. Industrial Rooftops is where Lara's run from the police reaches a dangerous high, literally, as she needs to cross the rooftops of tall industrial buildings while a machine gunning helicopter is chasing her. This is a quite difficult level as Lara needs to advance quickly in an environment that's easy to die in. She needs to slide down roofs, break down doors and climb ladders, all without either falling to her death or being killed by the helicopter. The level has excellent flow as you are urged to constantly push forward, while it's also very clear at any point where you need to go and what you need to do to get there. It certainly succeeds where its immediate predecessor didn't, as this level feels like a high-stakes thrill ride. Now, I would of course have liked if it had been a much longer level with at least twice as many buildings to scale and rooftops to cross, but for what this is, it's pretty good. The sanitarium marks a moment in the Angel of Darkness where the game takes a very notable dark turn. The player takes control of Curtis Trent for the first time here as he's exploring a disturbing sanitarium with scary straight-jacketed inmates. Some of these inmates attack Curtis while others don't, which is just wonderfully paranoia-inducing. Either way, their pathetic whimpers are creepy as hell. I have lots of praise for the sanitarium's unnerving setting and atmosphere, but unfortunately you don't actually do much in this level. It's a good example of a level that is very well presented but lacks compelling gameplay. Curtis's farsight ability is really cool as he uses it to search the building for door codes, but wouldn't it have been fun if the player controlled his farsight instead of it just being a cutscene? The sanitarium is an interesting level overall, however, as it's clear Cortisan used it to test new waters. Maximum Containment Area is similar to the sanitarium in setting and atmosphere, but much scarier. The enemies are more aggressive and dangerous here, and then there's the Proto-Nephilim that's running amok all over the facility as well. It bothers me that it's supposed to be this frightening monster when all I see is a pissed off baboon. Not that that isn't scary, but it's not quite end of the world levels of scary. The boss fight against it is incredibly lame as well. Besides that, however, this is a really cool level that deserves a lot of praise. Maximum Containment Area has a genuinely scary atmosphere and, unlike the sanitarium, it's got gameplay to support it. The entire Curtis section of the Angel of Darkness feels like it belongs to a survival horror video game and this level in particular feels like something straight out of Resident Evil with its zombie-like sanitarium inmates and laboratories and such. I appreciate them as an oddity in the Tomb Raider level family, but it's clear that they don't quite fit. Just before the grand finale of the Angel of Darkness, Lara must pass through an area simply known as the Lost Domain. Compared to previous penultimate levels in the Tomb Raider series, which tend to be some of the longest and most challenging, the Lost Domain is very short, but it certainly is challenging. 
Lara is presented with two dangerous looking rooms, neither of which seem particularly inviting. She needs to clear the lava room first to improve her lower body strength so she can perform sprint jumps which is required to reach a timed door in the other room. Following that, there is what seems to be a straight path to the level exit, but nothing is ever as simple as it seems. This final room looks absolutely incredible and might even be my favorite in the game. It serves as a wonderfully ominous entrance to the game's final level. Lara's final destination in the Angel of Darkness is Eckhart's lab, which is a creepy little den of torture devices, tools for alchemy and tubs of boiling water. There are also a couple of undead knights that Lara can knock into those aforementioned tubs. There is a terrifying part where Lara is almost boiled alive as she finds herself inside a cage that's being lowered into the boiling water. Lara is in this demented lab to finally deal with Eckhart. The boss fight against him is disappointingly easy however as the projectiles he fires towards Lara are very easy to dodge and even easier to cheese. Once Eckhart has been dealt with after a very tedious boss fight that takes forever, it turns out that the real villain is Karel. Um, okay. The fight against him is similar to the final showdown against Set in The Last Revelation as it's more of a platforming challenge than a boss fight per se, which I'm completely on board with. Overall, Eckhart's lab is a good level to end the Angel of Darkness, but primarily so for its first half. The Strahov Fortress is primarily set in a giant warehouse, which isn't a particularly engaging setting, but the varied gameplay makes up for it. This level's got Lara hitchhiking a container, using a giant magnet to wreak havoc, a complicated box puzzle and ladders. Lots and lots of ladders. Also, the soundtrack is a brooding yet slightly jazzy bop that perfectly fits this infiltration mission and is one of the most memorable tracks of the Angel of Darkness. Once Lara gets inside the ventilation shafts of the fortress, she witnesses the gruesome murder of Ludic, which is a quite shocking and dark moment in the game. Soon after, Lara accidentally releases the Proto-Nephilim from its cage, which I guess we can add to the list of questionable things she's done throughout the games. A smoldering, unsavory little runt and a cable spool running amok later, Lara reaches the exit of this surprisingly fun level. The Angel of Darkness is a very different kind of Tomb Raider game that mostly treads very unfamiliar ground, which is fine, but for this reason Tomb of Ancients kinda feels like a warm blanket as it's the most classic feeling level in the game. It feels like a throwback to an old school type of Tomb Raider level, particularly St. Francis' Folly with its verticality and bats. Lara needs to carefully descend this gigantic room and then ascend it for a bit to open the bottom exit with a switch. The sheer size of this place is equal parts impressive and intimidating. And with a dangerous gauntlet of traps to end the level, Tomb of Ancients truly feels like a tribute to the Tomb Raider levels of a bygone era. Louvre Storm Drains has a kick-ass soundtrack that really underscores Lara's dangerous mission in this level. She needs to infiltrate the world-famous Louvre Museum in the middle of the night, which, of course, is a near-impossible task. So, instead of barging in through the front door, Lara has infiltrated the storm drains beneath the museum. Here she needs to locate and turn five valves so she can stop the water flow and access the museum's boiler room. All this careful sneaking around in the sewers seems to be a bit redundant, however, when Lara just ends up blowing her way into the Louvre with a massive explosion anyway. Louvre Storm Drains is a good level that fundamentally works like one big puzzle, which I'm a huge fan of. Actually, it's kind of similar to Lost Valley from the first Tomb Raider game, but instead of cocks, she must locate valves, and instead of going behind a big waterfall, she must enter a big sewer pipe, and instead of dinosaurs, there are... rats.
When Lara first enters the Hall of Seasons, it serves solely as a hub for the elemental trials she must complete and as a place of punishment if she doesn't pull the correct levers to access the trials. It turns out there's a lot more to this level, however, once Lara returns to place the four elemental crystals. Deep down in the bowels of this ancient complex, below even the aforementioned Punishment Dungeon, there's a big scary furnace that Lara needs to activate in a complicated platforming sequence. Doing so gives her access to the upper levels of the Hall of Seasons. The highlight of the level, and one of my personal highlights of the game overall, is Lara's climb to the top of the dome as it's absolutely nerve-wracking. This moment alone justifies the introduction of Lara's grip meter in this game, as that meter is what makes this so exciting. Without it, this would just have been a tedious climb. The Hall of Seasons is a really good level so far, but then the level-ending boss fight happens. <sighs> Lara needs to grab an Obscura painting from a statue, but the painting moves to a different statue whenever she gets close to it, thanks to a mischievous ghost that's also attacking her. To stop the painting from moving, Lara needs to stun the ghost by shooting it, but it will only be stunned for what feels like a fraction of a second. There is an interesting idea here, but it feels incredibly underdeveloped as it's so damn awkward to pull off. The Serpent Rouge might be the most famous level from the Angel of Darkness due to its unique premise. Lara's broken into a closed-down nightclub where she must retrieve a box for either Pierre or Bernard depending on who she decided to talk to in the previous level. To do so, she must climb the light rakes in the ceiling, which is a dizzying, vertigo-inducing ascent that is equal parts exciting and nerve-wracking. However, I must address the elephant on the dance floor here. Climbing the light rakes in the ceiling is an excellent premise for a Tomb Raider level on paper, but the Angel of Darkness is not as well-oiled a machine as its predecessors. With the tight controls of a, say, Tomb Raider 3, this challenge would have been as much of a blast as the absolute banger that's being blasted out of the speakers. It's not like the controls are so bad that the task is not doable, but they do really put a damper on my enjoyment of it. Especially when I spent so long time doing it that the aforementioned banger starts getting on my nerves and I get mental images of some early noughties douchebag with a soul patch dancing to it. That may sound like a lot of criticism, but I actually kind of love this level. It's got so much heart and that's really all that matters. Following a rough night of running from the police, Lara wakes up in a Parisian ghetto the next morning where she must try and locate the elusive Bouchard. In this neighborhood of Paris, Lara can meet some of the charming locals, such as Robert Sadar lookalike, Pierre, the bartender, Janice, the streetwalker, and Bernard, the world's busiest man. Leave me alone, I'm busy. Busy? Doing what exactly? Leave me alone, I'm busy. There is lots of stuff for Lara to do here, however. She can sell her valuables at the pawn shop for cash, she can go visit the herbalist, and she can even win bets at the local boxing gym slash church. Parisian ghetto feels far removed from the stuff Lara typically does in the Tomb Raider games as there is not much platforming, combat, or, you know, tomb raiding here, but I'm okay with that. The level consists of a bunch of fresh ideas, and while I would have preferred fewer loading screens, it's a fun addition to the Tomb Raider level family with its authentic atmosphere, goofy characters, and open world-like structure. The Vault of Trophies is one of my favorite levels in the Angel of Darkness, and that's in spite of the fact that it opens with a freaking underwater maze. It's a very impressive level from a visual standpoint in particular, with the highlight in this regard being a big underwater room with a circle of statues with swords pointed towards the center. Lara needs to solve a puzzle here with an almost laughably easy solution, however. Here I was, ready to work out some complicated thing with Roman numerals, when all that LNV means is that Lara must interact with the statues that carry those initials. Besides that, however, this level is a joy to play through because of its intriguing medieval setting. Exploring this level feels like exploring some ancient wonder that the outside world has long forgotten about, which is what the Tomb Raider series once built itself upon. The 
The Angel of Darkness is set entirely in Paris and Prague, and nothing against two of the most famous and prettiest cities in the world, but they are a far cry from the exotic locations Lara usually explores. The bio-research facility makes up for that by placing her in big tropical greenhouses deep inside the Strahov Fortress. The beautiful, lush greenery really makes this level stand out amongst all the rather drab locations in the game. This level is just so pretty with all the exotic and dangerous flora, and gameplay-wise the level is really good and varied as well. I particularly like a puzzle where Lara must create a pesticide to kill a root that's keeping a door shut. There is also a bunch of enjoyable and exciting platforming sections in the level with more nerve-wracking races against Lara's grip meter. Not to mention the scary monsters Lara must deal with in a particularly frightening greenhouse in this facility. The bio-research facility's got a little bit of everything and with an interesting presentation to top it all off, what's not to like? <laughs> Aquatic Research Area is one of those levels where the entire thing is centered around solving a puzzle, which is one of my favorite types of Tomb Raider levels. Lara needs to pull a lever in a pool in this mysterious facility, but there's a big scary creature down there that will eat her if she tries. So what she needs to do is feed this monster. To do so, she must first restore the power, then fill a cart with fresh flesh, push the cart onto a lift, and then lower it into the water. Bon appétit! This puzzle is just so much fun to figure out. There is a wonderful simplicity to it, which makes Aquatic Research Area one of the most satisfying levels to play through. It's also a very beautiful level, rather surprisingly perhaps, as levels set in industrial environments typically don't have a lot of depth in that regard. The deep blue colors harmonize really well with the metallic textures of the place. Lara even switches to a badass looking wetsuit here, but she'll only wear it for a cup of coffee, unfortunately. Aquatic Research Area is a true hidden gem, as I feel like this level is completely overlooked amongst Tomb Raider fans, but it's just so much fun. Louvre Galleries is a fantastic Tomb Raider level with an astonishing attention to detail. Unleashing Lara Frickin' Croft on the world's most well-renowned collection of artifacts, art and treasures is simply a brilliant idea. This is, after all, the museum that in its possession has the portrait of the world's most recognizable woman. Uh, I mean the world's uh, second most recognizable woman. <laughs> Lara must carefully avoid laser alarms, shut up security guards and sneak into the vents just above the Mona Lisa in order to eventually access a mysterious archaeological dig inside a top secret part of the museum. Now if that's not an exciting objective, then I don't know what is. The many ways Lara must interact with this incredibly fascinating location are just so cool. The Angel of Darkness is a flawed game, but it absolutely shines here and this is a level every Tomb Raider fan should experience, even if they have no interest in this game overall. It's a near-perfect level that for one final time showcased the excellence of core design. That's it. That's my complete ranking of the levels of the Angel of Darkness. What are your favorite levels and what are your least favorites? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you so much for watching. Take care.